Well, I just finished 1 Corinthians 14. I actually finished doing 13, but this subject, what Paul is addressing is the misuse of tongues in the Corinthians congregation, and it goes on to other things as well. And uh, they're all very critical uh, for the moment. So uh, that I've been doing this study, and I finished and posted it. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. Interesting. Follow the way of unselfish, godly love, especially agape, that's self-sacrificial, to the think of others better than yourself, and sacrifice your time, life, and money for the other person, because that's the God puts you in that position to express godly love, especially in the edifying of fellow believers via spiritual gifts. The overriding principle, especially with spiritual gifts, is to exercise them with unselfish, self-sacrificing, the Christian agape love, edifying one another in a patient, kind, self-sacrificial, unselfish manner, as pointed out in the previous passage, 1 Corinthians 13, 4-8, which reads, Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude. It is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Wow. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. So believers are to follow the way of agape, a godly love, as Paul just got finished explaining in the previous chapter, especially in the desire and exercise of spiritual gifts for the unselfish benefit of others, not for the benefit of oneself. Now those gifts that we're talking about, they're all partial. Until the more complete comes, and we already went over that, the more complete is most likely, almost without a doubt in my mind, the New Testament Scriptures. That's the completed scripture, the canon of scripture, 66 books. And especially uh, with, the, with those books written to describe what happened from the first century on with our Lord Jesus Christ and his propitiation payment for the sins of the whole world. How do you talk about that? Well, they weren't written yet. Well, how do you authenticate that? Those eagerly desired special spiritual gifts, miraculous ones, were there to authenticate your testimony, because the New Testament scriptures had not been penned yet and distributed. So anyway, that's, Christians are to eagerly desire individuals who have certain spiritual gifts to be part of their assembly for its edification. Eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. The context of this verse is the assembled congregation in Corinth. The verb desire is plural, referring to the Corinthian believers as a group a local assembly, which is to eagerly desire to have individuals who have certain spiritual gifts to be part of their congregation for its edification, and also for an individual basis. I also mention that because God gives you these spiritual gifts before the foundation of the world. And you are to desire them, but that's your volition. And you desire that at the prompting of God, just as you're at the prompting of God, you choose to believe in Jesus Christ to be your Savior. Having paid the penalty for your sin. So since individuals have been blessed with every spiritual gift, every spiritual blessing, at the moment of faith alone in Christ alone, Ephesians 1, 3, then whatever spiritual gifts an individual is to receive hath been received at that point, before the foundation of the world. And you receive them in the, in the temporal life when you trust alone in Christ alone. Therefore, the eager desire for spiritual gifts referred to in verse 1 of 1, Corinthians 14, must be for the local assembly desiring individuals with specific gifts to join the assembly, as well as you desire those gifts to have them, and then you join the assembly. So spiritual gifts are to be used to benefit fellow believers out of self-sacrificial, agape Christian love, and not for self-centered reasons or in an unintelligible manner. 1 Peter 4.10 1 Peter 4.10, each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others faithfully, administering God's grace in its various forms. Ephesians 4.11-13, it was he, Jesus Christ, 
who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. We're constructing the body of Christ here with each individual until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of God. That's our job. That's our goal. Oh, it's sad to say the church has not measured up to that. It's sad to say I haven't. 1 Corinthians 12, 7. Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Especially the gift of prophecy is to be desired in the assembly. Eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. Paul puts the spiritual gift of tongues that they were abusing into perspective, telling the Corinthian believers how much more valued is the gift of prophecy for the benefit of the assembly. One to two, follow the way of love, agape love, self-sacrificial love, and eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. For anyone in the Corinthian assembly who is speaking in a language and a tongue is not speaking to men like he is supposed to. That's the criticism. But instead of, and wrongfully, to God. That's the context. Indeed, no one understands him. A friend of mine says, well, yeah, she speaks this tongue and no one has to understand you. But that's the job. Why would you speak in something that you didn't even know what you're speaking about? Which should not be the case. He utters mysteries, i.e. incomprehensible utterings with his human spirit. Why would you do that? Why would you utter comprehensible things? Then people can communicate with you. Paul addresses the abuse of tongues in the Corinthian assembly in light of his command to treat one another with unselfish, self-sacrificial Christian love. The context of this verse is the assembled congregation in Corinth, 1 Corinthians 11, 2 to 14, 40, especially 14, 4 to 5, in which utterance in a tongue was given without the benefit of interpretation. For because anyone in the Corinthian assembly who speaks in a tongue, like you are presently doing, Paul is critiquing them, is not speaking to men. Like he's supposed to, because it's therefore tongues is assigned a to unbelieving men, unbelievers, specifically Jews, of impending temporal judgment if they don't repent and turn back to God. He's not speaking to men, it's like he's supposed to, but instead, and wrongfully to God. Why would you speak in comprehension? God knows what you're talking about. For, because, refers back to the previous context. The overriding principle of treating one another with self-sacrificial, unselfish, Christian agape love, especially relative to the exercise of spiritual gifts. Tongues is to be spoken cognitively to men, not to God. So, for anyone in the Corinthian assembly to get this, who is speaking in a tongue is not speaking to men like he's supposed to, but it's standing wrongfully to God. Indeed, no one understands him, which should not be the case. He utters mysteries, by incomprehensible utterings in his own mind with his human spirit, right, in his humanity, and he's speaking this to God, like as if God's going to make sense of it, and then, hey, God wants you to talk to him in plain, the plain language, plain English, pray to him, right, speaking a language that you understand and know the meaning of what you're asking, especially in prayer. This is not a prayer language. You speak to God as best you can, pray, and as best you can, the Holy Spirit will then take those uh, prayers, which are imperfect, and perfect them, and God will answer them to your best benefit ever. So, note, notice that God is not supposed to be the designated audience man is. Therefore, tongues is a sign for unbelieving Jews of impending temporal judgment. 14.21, man is. More specifically, unbelieving Jews, 21 to 22, God being omniscient does not need someone to utter something to him that heretofore was a mystery. There's no mystery to God. He's omniscient. Those are all. 1 Corinthians 14, 22 indicates that the audience of tongues is to be unbelievers, not believers. Oneself or God. 14, 22, tongues then are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers, prophecy. However, it is for believers, not for unbelievers. Compare 1 Peter 4.10. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in his various forms. 
Compare 1 Corinthians 12, 7. Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. The Corinthians, tongue speakers, might very well have been speaking to a pagan god. That's what they did before they became believers. For anyone in the Corinthian assembly who speaks in a tongue is not speaking to men, but to God, a God. Consider the Greek grammar in 1 Corinthians 14.2. To God could also be translated to a God. The, the Greek has no definite article in verse 2, which accompanies the Greek word for God, teo. So, and, and such anothrous, without a definite article constructions, usually are translated with an indefinite article, a. Compare Acts 17.23, which refers to an unknown God. Same construction. This is supported by the fact that the Bible records no instance of believers speaking to God in anything but normal, intelligible, intelligible language. You don't need a prayer language, just pray. Even in Jesus' great high priestly prayer, in which the Son poured out his heart to the Father. Do tongues, tongues is to be spoken so that the speaker and the hearers understand what is being said. Indeed, no one understands him, which should be, not be the case. He utters mysteries, incomprehensible utterings, with his human spirit. The context here is one of rebuke for what the Corinthian churches are permitting in their local assemblies relative to speaking in tongues. Not only are the words spoken incomprehensibly to the speaker, but all, they were apparently unknown to everyone in the congregation, being without interpretation, which they wrongly directed toward a god, a god, instead of toward fellow believers. Now this may have very well been the self-centered, ungodly, pagan, religious, ecstatic speech uncommon to local religions in the area, from which background many of the Corinthian believers came, for it is referred to elsewhere in ancient Greek writings with the same root word, glossa. David K. Lowry from Bible Knowledge Commentary. One common view is to see Paul's use of the word tongue, glossa, against the background of first century pagan religions, and thus define it as ecstatic speech, because that's what it was, similar to that expressed by the Sibylla or female prophetesses. We also have the Cumain or Sibyl, Virgil, was the most famous of the ten female prophetesses, prophetesses claimed by various regions. Others see the tongue speaking in 1 Corinthians as ecstatic speech, similar to that of Pythia, the female oracle at Delphi, similar to the Menads of Dionysus in their ecstatic frenzy. So they had that tradition, and people who don't have the gift of, of uh, tongues, known languages, uh, may want to uh, go back to their old tradition for the attention they might be able to get. Anyway, 1 Corinthians 14, 13 to 17. For this reason, anyone who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret what he says. Objectors contend that there is more than one type of tongues speaking here, a provide private prayer language and a public edification tongue. But there is no such distinction here made or anywhere else in Scripture. All tongue speaking is to be done to others so that the speaker and the hearers understand. For I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. The Christian's mind is not to be unfruitful like some pagan religious cults encourage, Buddhist chants, for example. So what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit, the human spirit, with your mind, but I also pray with my mind. But I will speak, I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my mind. Be coherent. Have something intelligible. If you are praising God with your spirit, how can one who finds himself among those who do not understand say, Amen to your thanksgiving, since he does not know what you're saying? You may be giving thanks well enough in your own mind, but the other man is not edified. And you might even think that you're a little bit off in your mentality. The key for believers is to do what edifies others. The context of chapter 14 in 1 Corinthians is one in which the author's the author Paul is speaking specifically to the believers at Corinth relative to how they were misusing the gift of tongues. The Corinthian tongue speakers were not communicating to men like they were supposed to be doing, but speaking incomprehensible words to gods, to God. There is no edification in the body of Christ going on here at all. It's a misuse. 
nor does the individual himself know what he is saying. 